In this video, we are going to be talking about mechanism steps, as well as doing a little bit of review on arrow pushing. So in a previous video, um, we talked about arrow pushing in regards to resonance. And so we're going to be using a lot of those same ideas with mechanism steps today. So just to remind you, um, a curved arrow has two components. It has a tail and then it has the head. And the important part of this is that the head tells you how many electrons we are pushing with this arrow. So in this case, our head is double barbed. It has two little lines on the head and that shows the movement of two electrons. So that means if we were to draw a curved arrow from these two electrons over to something else, we're moving both of these electrons. In later chapters, you are going to learn about a single barbed arrow and see the difference how this one has two lines, this one has one. This would show the movement of a radical electron or one electron. So now we're going to be talking about mechanism steps. Um, and there are four main types that we're going to do a quick overview of. And then I'm going to go into detail and give you an example of each one. So our first mechanism step is called a nucleophilic attack. And if you're not sure what a nucleophile is, there is another video um, on nucleophiles and examples of nucleophiles that could be really beneficial for you to watch before this one. The next one, we have the loss of a leaving group. And then we have a proton transfer. And then we also have a carbocation rearrangement. And within this one, there are two different types of carbocation rearrangements. So now let's go into a little bit more depth on each of these. So a nucleophile um, is going to be something that has a lot of free electrons that it can use to react. So a good example of a nucleophile is going to be an anion. So something like chloride. Um, or it could be something like MeOH. This is also a nucleophile. However, when you have an R group connected to a hydroxyl group, this is always going to be a weak nucleophile. It is still a nucleophile though, and it still will um, perform a nucleophilic attack. So let's talk about the actual mechanism. When you have an electrophilic center, so that would be something like a carbocation or um, a place where you have a leaving group that pulls electrons towards it, that gives this carbon right here a partial positive charge, making this carbon very electrophilic. So when you have an electrophile and you're reacting it with a nucleophile, so for this example, I'm going to use a bromide ion. So we have our nucleophile, our bromide ion. Um, all that's gonna happen is one arrow. Your arrow is going to come from the electron-rich nucleophile, and it's going to attack the electrophile. And when that happens, you're creating a new bond. So now you have that bromine stuck onto the electrophile. In this case, when you have a leaving group that is still there, this is going to go through um, something called a substitution reaction. And we're gonna have more videos on substitution reactions later. Um, but the purpose of this video is just to understand that when you have a good leaving group, that's electronegative, that makes it an electrophile, and that's where a nucleophile will attack. So the big takeaway with this one is this arrow right here coming from the electrons of the nucleophile attacking an electrophile. In this next mechanism step, we have the loss of a leaving group. So let's talk about what a leaving group is. So the leaving group in this molecule is our chlorine right here. And this chlorine is very electronegative. 
And because the chlorine is very electronegative, that means that it can exist as a chloride ion. And it would be happy doing that because of its electronegativity. So with that being said, this mechanism step is just showing the movement of the electrons from the leaving group bond. And the leaving group is going to take those electrons with it. So you're gonna draw the arrow from the bond to the leaving group. And that releases the leaving group from the molecule and gives it two more electrons. So our next mechanism step is called a proton transfer. And before we talk about exactly how this one works, we need to first establish what a proton is. So in organic chemistry, a proton is going to be a hydrogen that lost an electron. So the hydrogen atom has one electron. So if we lose that one electron, we end up with a proton, which is a positively charged hydrogen. This is good to keep in mind as we keep going because we're going to also talk about something called a hydride shift later on. And it's good to distinguish the difference between a proton and a hydride because a hydride is actually the anion of a hydrogen atom. So that means your hydrogen is going to have an extra electron and it's going to therefore have that negative charge. So let's talk about the actual steps behind the proton transfer. This one is going to have two arrows. So a proton transfer is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You're going to be transferring a proton, a hydrogen without its electrons, from one thing to another. So in this case, we have HBr. HBr is an acid, it's a strong acid, and we also have water, which can either be an acid or a base. So relative to HBr, water is pretty basic. So basically, what's gonna happen when you react an acid with a base is that the base is gonna reach out and grab that proton. And so that's what we're gonna say as we draw these two arrows. So our base is going to reach out and grab the proton, but we know that we're grabbing a proton. That means we can't take the electrons with it. So we're gonna have to do something with the two electrons of this bond right here. So basically what we're gonna do is we're going to donate these electrons back to where they came from. So whatever is immediately attached to that hydrogen it is going to get the electrons from the bond. So one more time, the base is gonna reach out and grab the proton. The proton is going to donate its electrons back to where it came from. And I always say this in my head when I'm drawing out a proton transfer because it's really easy to wanna to do it the opposite way. It's really easy to say, okay, um, I want the hydrogen to be attached to the base, so I'm gonna draw the arrow from the hydrogen to the base, but that's not the case. Your arrows are always gonna go from the electrons that are doing the work. So the last mechanism step we're gonna talk about is called a carbocation rearrangement. And that's kind of an umbrella term for two different ones. We have a methyl shift and we also have a hydride shift. And they're very similar, but there is a very specific difference between the two. So before we jump into the mechanism, let's talk about what a carbocation is. A carbocation is going to be a carbon atom that has a positive charge. That means that the carbon atom is always going to have three bonds because we know that there's one bond to the other carbon atom on this one. And then that means we have two hydrogens attached. And the reason we have that positive charge there is because there's not that fourth bond to saturate it, giving it a positive charge. So let's talk about carbocation stability. You have here a primary carbocation that means our positive charge is on a carbon that only has one other carbon group attached to it. We're not counting hydrogen atoms when we talk about this. Here we have a secondary carbocation. You can see that we have one, two, 
other carbon groups attached to the carbon that has that positive charge. Over here we have a tertiary carbocation. This carbon that has the positive charge has one, two, three other carbon groups attached to it, making it tertiary. So the big takeaway from car carbocation stability is that a tertiary carbocation is the most stable. And this is really an important concept because it gives us a why behind doing a carbocation rearrangement. So both methyl shifts and hydride shifts have the same purpose. Their purpose is to make a carbocation more stable. So if we look at the example that I have here, we have a secondary carbocation. However, we could possibly move this to a position that's more stable. And for this specific example, the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna move a methyl group. So we're basically going to grab this methyl group right here, draw an arrow to where we wanna move the methyl group to. And in doing this, we are moving the positive charge to a tertiary location, which would make it more stable. So we picked up the methyl group, we moved it over a spot. That makes this carbon now not positive because we filled it up. This bond now has four bonds, or sorry, that carbon now has four bonds. This one lost a bond, so that positive charge actually got shifted over to the other spot. And now we have a tertiary, more stable carbocation. So a hydride shift is going to be the exact same idea as a methyl shift. We still want to move that secondary carbocation to a more stable position. However, you can see that in this situation, if we decided to do a methyl shift and we moved over a methyl group, that's not really helping our problem because if we move over a methyl group in this, in this scenario, that's putting that positive charge on a secondary position again. So for this one, we're gonna have to take something else. And lucky for us, we have a free hydrogen on this carbon. So instead of a methyl, we're gonna grab a hydrogen and we're gonna move the hydride over to the current location of the positive charge. And in doing that, we're moving the positive charge to the more stable position. So all we did was grab that hydride and we stuck it where that carbocation was and that actually moves the carbocation to where the hydride was. And so just remember, we talked a little bit about the difference between a proton and a hydride um, earlier in the video. I just wanna reiterate that in the hydride shift, we are actually moving the hydrogen plus its bond. That arrow is coming from the bond of the hydrogen over. Whereas in the proton transfer, we had a base grabbing a proton, but we had to leave those electrons behind. So that's the big difference between these two. I hope you found this video to be really helpful. The concepts and information presented in these videos will be true no matter what Organic Chemistry 1 class you are taking. However, the concepts presented in this video are referencing material currently covered in Baylor University's coursework. Remember, if you are a currently enrolled Baylor student, we offer free tutoring services. Our tutoring center is located on the first floor of the Sid Richardson Building. You will find all the details you need about these services on our website, www.baylor.edu slash tutoring. You may schedule a free 30-minute one-on-one tutoring session online or just drop in during any of our open business hours. For more information about our current services, please visit our website. Thank you.